now available in paperback and e-readers, Spellbound, a darker shade of black. Get your copy today at your favorite online bookseller. Better get the cool slow, y'all, because we're having us a barbecue. <laughs> There's a white guy on TikTok who wants to know why many of us black Gen Xers are so angry. Now this white guy Clay Edwards comes on TikTok and asks the question, why are so many black Gen Xers so angry? And according to him, we grew up in one of the best eras of race relations. And according to him, because we grew up in one of the best eras of race relations, where we never saw a Klansman, black people shouldn't be angry and shouldn't be talking about racism and white supremacy. Well, when I listen to Clay Edwards, he basically sounds like one of these beta males who basically is living in a rose-colored reality because as a black Gen Xer who grew up in the 1980s, I can tell you that the world wasn't as rosy as Clay Edwards is presenting. Now, as someone who grew up in the 1980s, I never saw a Klansman in real life here in New York City but I experienced a whole lot of racism from their descendants and those who benefit from the system of white supremacy that they enforce here in this blue state that is supposed to be so tolerant and accepting. Now, as I was growing up in the 1980s, I experienced a lot of racism when my family and myself would go out to places like stores. I mean, when a black kid like myself went to a store, we were basically being watched because most people who were white and non-black always thought that we would be out stealing. And that's basically a narrative that carried on from the days of the Jim Crow South that was projected onto black children like myself. So that's some of, that's just some of the racism I experienced growing up as a kid. Other forms of racism I experienced as a kid is seeing people pull away when I walked or up or uh, people stopping because they were afraid that I was going to do something to them. Again, these are the racist stereotypes that black Gen X kids had to deal with out here when we were just walking around in, going to school or going to go get our food like a pizza, slice of pizza or just going out to buy comic books. We ran into all sorts of racism and this guy wants to say, oh, why are so many black Gen Xers talking about racism? Well, we experienced a lot of racism here in New York City 
every day, again, from being followed around in stores, from having our, having to check our bags at the front of the store because people thought that we would be shoplifting, and also having to deal with police officers looking at us with a side eye, whereas when he, as a white guy like him, he never had to experience any of that at all. Now, this same guy wants to go on and again talk about why black people people are talking about racism and now because we never saw a Klansman, things were much better. Well, was it much better in, on one day in 1989 here in New York City when 16-year-old, I believe, Yusuf Hawkins went down to Brooklyn to go look at a car and as he went to go look at a car, a mob of white teenagers came and ambushed him and one of them pulled a firearm and shot and killed him. I mean, that basically was a textbook example of a group of Klansmen who, while they weren't wearing hoods, participated in a lynch mob, and that lynch mob basically came down because of alleged rumors of a white female saying that she was going to bring some black guys to Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and those guys in Bensonhurst basically acted like their descendants who came from different parts of the world and looked to go out and participate in a lynch mob against Yusuf Hawkins. Now, some people would say this is a bit of a straw man argument, but this is basically what happened in 1989 to Yusuf Hawkins, and I can go back to other incidents of people like Michael Griffith, who basically was chased on Howard Beach as he came down to Howard Beach to buy a slice of pizza, and he was chased by a, by a mob of white guys uh, onto the, onto the um, expressway and wound up getting struck and killed by a car. So he's sitting there talking about how it was the best race relations between blacks and whites, but I have given you two examples that you can go do your own research on and find out how race relations were not so good between black and white people here in New York City, a blue state where everybody basically was supposed to be so tolerant and so accepting. And here in New York, people were not being tolerant and accepting as related to the Howard Beach incident, as related to the Bensonhurst incident, and many other incidents of racism that foundational black Americans had to deal with every day, like the racial profiling for being in a store, like the racial profiling we dealt with if we went out here and bought a nice car, like a Cutlass or a Caprice or a Cadillac, or even our Mercedes Benz or a BMW, most police were out here racially profiling us, saying that we were drug dealers, even though many of us black men went out here and did have jobs in places like UPS and the post office, we were racially profiled as related to owning that car. But according to Clay Edwards, oh, everything was so good. Well, he never lived in this blue state of New York City that was supposed to be so tolerant and accepting and see all the racism that was going on. And there was so much racism going on that Spike Lee talked about it in his 1989 movie, Do the Right Thing. So it basically, again, shows me that this guy is living in a rose-colored reality as related to what he thought were these idealized race relations because black people were dealing with oppression right here in a leftist blue state. And we were dealing with this all throughout the 80s. And, but he's going to sit there and say everything was so good and we shouldn't be complaining about racism and white supremacy. Well, there was a lot of racism and white supremacy going on at that time in the 80s and it wasn't the golden age that Clay Edwards wants to claim it is. Now, Clay Edwards, as he goes on, he wants to say that because we all listened to the same music and watched the same basketball players like Michael Jordan, everything was good, but no, it wasn't good at all. 
Yeah, we got a lot of guys out here who did get some success, like Bill Cosby, who had ushered in a golden age of black entertainment. But a lot of the people who he was talking about, these people were not really looking to do anything for black people. Many of these rappers that he talks about, like Snoop and Tupac, again, these were just Hollywood shills who were put out here to go out here and promote anti-black messaging and promote anti-black messaging in the form of this entertainment which basically romanticized a lot of old stereotypes because if clay were to actually do some research on many of the rappers who he was talking about he would find out many of those rappers basically hijacked hip-hop and took it away from its original message the original message of rap and hip-hop was originally supposed to be rhythm and poetry meant to uplift and empower black people and what happened was is that they went out here and Hollywood hijacked rap music because they didn't want to see us promoting black empowerment messages that were starting to come out in 1989 from rappers like um, Lakim Shabazz and guys like X-Clan and people out here going out here promoting black empowerment messages no, what they wanted to do was create gangster rap, and gangster rap basically is a creation of white supremacists in Hollywood who wanted to go out here and see their stereotypes be influenced on young black children and promote the idea that life in the streets is the only life that they want to see black people live in because what many white supremacists want to have is their smooth world where black people are in a perpetual ghetto and living at the bottom of the world. That's what many white supremacists in Hollywood that Clay Edwards doesn't want to see who make the music that he likes. That's the kind of music they want to see from black people, not the kind of messages of empowerment that X-Clan and many, and Lakim Shabazz and many others went out here and presented. I mean, they don't want no guy like King Sun talking about black empowerment. No, they don't want those kinds of rappers. No, what they want to do is have their smooth world where they don't have to deal with actual intelligent black people like myself who are Gen Xers. No, they don't want to have that world. And that's the reason why this Clay Edwards basically was talking about all these gangster rappers, but wasn't talking about any of the other rappers that I mentioned or other positive rappers out here who were promoting positive messages like Kid and Play or many of the other rappers out here like Heavy D. I mean, he wasn't talking about those rappers. No, he immediately goes over to the ones that basically make many of the white people out and racists out here feel comfortable, which are the gangster rappers. And he also goes on to talk about how we had Michael Jordan posters on our wall. Well, my cousin was a big fan of Michael Jordan, but I wasn't a big fan of Michael Jordan as a Gen Xer. And I wasn't a fan of Michael Jordan because back in the 1989, I believe, after a kid wound up getting killed over his Air Jordan sneakers that he basically s signed off on them being over $100, Michael Jordan basically said to the, to the world that he wasn't responsible for that kid's life. And that really pissed me off because here was the guy who, again, basically making all this money on, on these sneakers that I knew back in 1984 only cost $50 when the Air Jordan first came out. And up until about 1988, these sneakers were basically about $50 to $75, and people didn't really care too much about them until they raised the price. And when they raised the price of the Air Jordan, that's when you had a lot of the dope boys buying these sneakers to make an attachment as a status item to get the attention of the girls in the 80s, and that led to these sneakers basically being putting a target on a black boy's back, and if a black boy put those sneakers on, it basically led to that black boy putting his life in jeopardy. And lots of boys, again, put their lives at risk putting these sneakers on in the late 80s, but Michael Jordan didn't care, and all he cared about was making his money. But that doesn't matter to Clay Edwards, who wants to say, oh, I had a Michael Jordan poster on my wall. Why are you Gen Xers complaining about racism? Well, we're complaining about racism because 
Michael Jordan, the black bootlick that he is, really didn't care about black people, and the white institution basically drove up the price of these sneakers, which only cost $4 to make in Korea, only cost 4 bucks to make in Korea, charged people in the black community over $100, and put black boys at risk, and this system basically benefited from making making black people suffer again putting black people's lives at risk over these sneakers that again only cost four dollars and led to black people dying but he doesn't care again he had the michael jordan poster on his wall so everything was perfectly fine for him in his part of the country well it wasn't fine for all of us black boys and black men who are Gen Xers, it wasn't fine for us out here. And again, Michael Jordan wasn't that great as related to having character because he really wasn't about black people. I mean, he went out here, married a Hispanic woman, abandoned the black community, but for him, that's considered one of his heroes, just like Tupac Shakur. I mean, he sit there and he talks about Tupac Shakur, again, another black bootlick who basically, again, sold out the black community a mama's boy who was presenting an image of a thug, but was basically a slave behind the scenes, a slave behind the scenes who was doing the dirty work of his white supremacist paymasters in the music industry. And Tupac wasn't as deep as people thought. No, he was a mama's boy. But this guy, again, wants to extol him as one of the great black people. And, that, and that's one of the reasons why we shouldn't be complaining about white supremacy and racism. And I find it interesting that this dude, when he talks about black people, the only black people who he knows are entertainers, and he wants to talk about, oh, how we were on each other's couch. Well, that wasn't the case for me here in New York. No, many of the Puerto Rican kids, again, they would talk to us in school, but we weren't really tight like that. No, I know it was as far as it went, which was usually just the Puerto Rican kids, because most of the white people had moved out of the Bronx, so there were no white people on my couch, and I wasn't going to anybody's house because the crime was so crazy back in the 80s, because we were coming in the early 80s out of the heroin um, epidemic, and as I entered into junior high school, we came into the crack epidemic. So people weren't going to people's houses like that because you basically were living in a world of zombies who were basically on the street. Either they were having a heroin on days or they were out here scavenging for crack, basically just doing anything to get some crack. So he's sitting there talking about how we were on each other's couch. No, we were in the house in many cases before three or five o'clock because you didn't want to be out here on these streets with these crack addicts out here in the late 80s or the heroin addicts in the early 80s and by late 1989 you didn't want to be on these streets because the dope dealers basically ran the block and if, whoever they had beef with because these guys were high on their emotions and high on the money that they were making, they were basically would shoot anyone who they who got them upset. And he, he's sitting there talking about, oh, how it was just a glorious time. Well, did he? I this guy never lived in 1980s New York. And again, I go in depth on the real 1980s New York in two of my books, John Haynes' 1987 and in Spellbound. And I give you a dark picture of the reality that went on at that time. I give you the picture that Clay Edwards never lived, and he's sitting there asking why are so many black people angry who are Gen Xers, and I'll give him the answer to why many of us are, as he says, angry. Now, he's sitting there saying that we are angry, and again, this is him projecting the stereotype of the angry black man and angry black woman onto us because we're not really, again, always angry all the time. No, that's a projection that many racists pr put on us because in their world, the only black people they feel comfortable with are angry black people because angry black people give them a justification to do harm to us. So he's, he's projecting that onto us, not understanding what is an issue 
for most of us foundational black American Gen Xers. Because for most of us foundational black American Gen Xers, what we really have an issue with is the is the hypocrisy of spellbound individuals like Clay Edwards who want to live in a rose-colored reality because they don't want to fit us into a black box that is acceptable to them. And for him, he wants to fit us into the angry black box that he feels is acceptable to make his world smooth. He feels that to make his world smooth, he needs to have black Gen Xers be angry. Well, a lot of us are frustrated about the whole hypocrisy of many of the white folks who grew up in that era and grew up experiencing this so-called idealized world that they saw on shows like G.I. Joe and Bionic 6 and Ghostbusters and many of these programs where we saw black people included. But these people, even though they saw all these messages in this programming, made an effort to exclude Gen Xers like myself when we graduated high school and we entered and went to college and went to the and went to come into the job market when many of us went to try to live that dream this is where these people went out here and created a, a dysfunctional reality by following in the footsteps of their parents by not heeding the messages in that media but going out here and showing by their actions they were going to continue supporting the system of white supremacy because they wanted to continue receiving the economic benefits from that system. Because if these individuals were supposed to be all about not being racist, why is a guy like me who graduated at the top of his class not able to have a full-time job and, was, and has been out of work for 15 years critical question I want to ask Clay Edwards because I have been dealing with the racism in the job market for the last 15 years as related to this group of Gen Xers who talk about, again, tolerance and acceptance and talk about, oh, we, we lived in a world of, oh, there's not, there's not the racism. We didn't see a Klansman. Well, why is it hard for heterosexual black men like myself to find jobs? I mean, when it comes time for these many of these white guys, they go out here and they'll be able to get a job just with a high school diploma. Some of them even drop out of school. Some of them can go to prison for felonies and can still go back and live a middle class lifestyle. But a guy who has no criminal record is on time and has a good work ethic. He can't, a black man like myself, the people don't want to make a call and, and even go for an interview. That's really, again, shows the racism that he wants to talk about. And he it doesn't exist, but this is what makes many Gen Xers like myself, who are black, extremely angry, because the hypocrisy of many of these white individuals like him want to go out here and say, oh, we're all about not participating in the racism our fathers participated in, but here you are participating in that racism openly in many of these so-called blue tolerant states and even in the red states we already know what the deal is but you don't what you sit there and say one thing and you do another and that really again shows by the the black people who he talked about i mean he's talking about tupac he's talking about many of the snoop and all the and michael jordan again these black men again are entertainers but he, and these are entertainers that really were not looking to help out other black people and basically shows that the kind of black person he feels comfortable with because those black people basically fit all the stereotypes that he feels comfortable with. You got Snoop, who's a weed head, who's in the streets. You got Michael Jordan, who's an, a bootlick, who basically plays basketball very well. You got him talking about all these other guys. And again, no, but not talking about any of the black people who have gone out here to have success that can compete with him. I noticed he didn't talk about Bill Cosby. He didn't talk about Spike Lee. He didn't talk about the Hudlin brothers. Didn't talk about many of the black people who were making inroads as related to jobs as related to we've never seen that before like with Keith David and Sally Richardson Whitfield being the first two black actors to lead a Disney in a voiceover on the show Gargoyles 
or talking about other black people who had great accomplishments like the late great Dwayne McDuffie as related to Milestone Comics. I mean, not talking about any of those black people, just the rappers and the entertainers and the ball players, and talking about those rappers, entertainers, and ball players because those are the only black people he feels comfortable with. No, he doesn't feel comfortable around a guy like a Sean James who is um, out here can talk intelligently, speak articulately, and present talking points to sh basically shatter all of his narratives with facts and research and basically eyewitness accounts because as a black Gen Xer, I can tell you again, it wasn't that good here in a blue tolerant leftist state like New York. So I know race relations were a lot rougher across the country, but he wants us to believe that everything is going good because we grew up in the 1980s. Again, this era was basically, again, yes, we did make a little progress, but that progress basically was pulled back by 1989 because we saw that when the rap wasn't allowed to grow to be the black empowerment message, it was supposed to be. No, that message was taken away by white supremacists who wanted to get black people back on the ghetto plantation. And this guy basically, again, doesn't see the big picture. And he doesn't see the big picture mainly because he is spellbound. And again, the spellbound white guy can be just as dangerous as the spellbound black person. And I talk about that in a chapter of Spellbound where Matilda's white father basically starts to become spellbound because he wants to clout chase the head of his English department at Columbia University. And he basically becomes so spellbound about looking to clout chase that he doesn't really th look think about his biracial daughter's safety. And that's the point that I see with this guy, Clay Edwards. He's so spellbound by looking to try to fit into those higher white social circles that he just is oblivious to the racism. And that basically shows as related to his whole argument regarding Donald Trump. Now, according to Clay Edwards, we should be supporting Donald Trump because we didn't ever experience a Klansman and because we should um, uh, be appreciative of a Donald Trump basically being out here and representing what he thinks are the ideals of diversity and inclusion. And he also goes on to say that because Donald Trump is not a racist in his eyes, oh, black people should be supporting him. Well, again, he's still, again, spellbound, and again, spellbound because he's looking to clout chase by saying, oh, Donald Trump isn't a racist, but I take you back to 1989 and the Central Park Five and Donald Trump putting out an ad saying that these five teenagers basically should um, be punished and putting a full page ad in the newspapers at the time, again, putting that fact right in front of you, not to mention the discrimination as related to his properties, but we're supposed to support this individual, even though he's got a record of doing things that are detrimental to black people, again, looking to sway jurors in that Central Park Five case, which didn't really get a fair investigation due to Prosecutor Linda Fairstein showing clear bias and never really looking to get an investigation going on. This was presented in Ava DuVernay's When They See Us and was also proven in 2000 when the actual person who participated in the violation of that white woman basically confessed to the crime. So he's sitting there saying, oh, again, we should support Donald Trump, but the whole thing is he hasn't shown any sort of interest in, again, looking out for black people for years. Moreover, he hasn't presented anything tangible to foundational black Americans in exchange for their votes. So as a black Gen Xer, again, I know the story on Donald Trump here in the 80s, and I also know the story of why many white males like him want to support Donald Trump. And the main reason they want to support him is, again, basically because many of these white folks are upset that the government has not really provided them with a capable white male leader, and many of them are upset because their whole reality as related to their smooth world got shattered because Barack Obama was elected president of the United States. Now, Barack Obama was elected president of the United States mainly because George W. Bush fucked up 
during his eight years in office, and after George W. Bush fucked up in his eight years in office, what they had was nobody to go out here and pick up the baton on the red or the blue side outside of Barack Obama, and many people in America, they're upset at Barack Obama for winning the presidency, but they don't want to ever look at the big picture and see that they never really groomed another white person to be able to take over that job. And that's the thing that's got many of these racists upset. It's got them upset that, that, that Barack Obama became president. And the whole idea of this biracial black man being president with black features, this shatters their smooth world and shatters the rose-colored reality that many of these white racists and non-black white, non-black racists live in. And they have not been able to reconcile the whole concept that a black man won the presidency. So they go out here and look to project onto black Gen Xers like myself by saying that we're so angry and that we should support Donald Trump. But in actuality, a lot of us, yes, we are angry about the hypocrisy of this country. We're angry that we were denied opportunities because of the racism in this country. We're angry that we were basically told a lie, a lie that basically many of these guys who are in this rose-colored reality continue to want to believe. And again, what's got them upset at us and looking to project their ideas on us is they have to live in a real world with real black people like myself who can speak for ourselves and have differing opinions. They don't like living in a world where they have to live with real black people. No, what they want to do is go back to their smooth world where they can have no conflicts, problems, or obstacles from many of these pookies and ray rays and who will basically be at the bottom of the world and they can basically sit there and listen to these entertainers tell them what they want to hear and these athletes tell them what they want to hear they don't want to hear from real people like myself no they don't want to hear from real black gen xers who basically lived in a world where we still were dealing with racism, still were dealing with a system of white supremacy denying us opportunities, even though they promised us when I was in high school and college we would be able to get jobs if we did the right thing. And I did do the right thing. I was on the honor roll in my high school. I graduated at the top of my class, but I still have not been able to get that basic entry-level job that will allow me to be able to live the American dream. This is one of the reasons why I am just, again, disgusted, because at 50 years old, I should be in, a, in my own home. I should be able to have lived a middle-class lifestyle based on the ideals that were presented to me on shows like The Cosby Show. I mean, a black man with a college degree should be living very well, but I have not been allowed to have that opportunity due to the white supremacist H.R. brick wall that keeps black men like myself out of jobs or underemployed on jobs. But according to Clay Edwards, we black Gen Xers, he's wondering why we're angry. Well, we are angry again because we believed in this whole idea. We bought into this idea as kids. We had this idea sold to us on shows like the real Ghostbusters, G.I. Joe, Trent, Transformers, The Cosby Show, A Different World. I mean, we were taught that, oh, this world was so about giving you a chance, but many of us never really got that chance. We all had great talent and great potential, and we never got that shot to be able to take ourselves to the next level due to the racism of the white supremacist system. And that racism has continued to be perpetuated by many of the white and non-black Gen Xers who got opportunities ahead of us. And this is the core reason why I stand for reparations, because many of us black Gen Xers, we were denied opportunities to go out here and be able to live our American dream. We were denied by these HR brick walls that were erected by white supremacists who used feminist gatekeepers to keep us from being able to get jobs. Fem gatekeepers who kept us out of the job market, gatekeepers who kept us out of the housing market, gatekeepers who kept us from being able to rise to that middle class lifestyle. I mean, 
gatekeepers kept us out for all those years of our prime years because I remember being in my 20s and just running into all of this resistance and basically people not wanting to give a guy like me who came out of college a chance but they would go out here and find a, a, a white convicted felon or they'd find a pookie and give them a job and do this again basically because those people fit into their ideas of a smooth world but didn't want to deal with the reality of a black man who was able to compete and ready to show what he could do no they don't want to go out here and give that black man an opportunity so if you want to know why many black gen xers are so angry we're angry because we lived in a world of lies we lived in a world of people talking a lot of stuff but never really following through and this guy basically doesn't have a clue to what was going on as related to black Gen Xers and doesn't understand the reality of us foundational black Americans. I mean, he's received all the benefits from the system of white supremacy. He's lived a nice life. He's lived very well. And he doesn't want to see anybody else, again, stuck in his own box looking to be accepted by other white people, looking to clout chase people like Donald Trump. Again, this is a textbook example of what I talk about in Spellbound. This is the kind of codependent relationship that we have as related to race relations because we have spellbound whites who want to fit, who want to live in their world, and we have spellbound blacks who want to fit into a black box that's acceptable to white people. And those spellbound blacks basically create a buffer because they want to stay in that world, looking to receive benefits from the system of white supremacy. So this is what I'm going to, again, these are my thoughts as related to what this guy talked about, because again, as somebody who was a black Gen Xer, who lived in that era, again, I can tell you that the world wasn't as rosy or rose-colored as what Clay Edwards wants to propose. Now, this was a video requested by one of my viewers, and if you want to request a video, you can send a donation for a minimum of $15 to the Cash App by clicking the links in the description box. And if you want to learn more about what leads to this dysfunctional state of race relations, you can pick up my novel, Spellbound, on Amazon.com, or my book, John Haynes, 1987, and learn about what life really was like in the 80s from somebody who actually lived during the 80s. That's all I have to say for this video. You can comment, rate, and subscribe. Now available in paperback and e-readers, John Haynes, 1987. Learn lessons about life and teenage love in the 1980s in this coming-of-age John Haynes story. Get your copy of John Haynes 1987 in paperback and e-readers at Amazon.com and online booksellers everywhere. Now available in paperback and e-readers, John Haynes Illuminati, a man who rules the world, takes on the head of the global elite in this all-new action-packed John Haynes series adventure. Get your copy of John Haynes Illuminati in paperback and e-readers at Amazon.com and online booksellers everywhere. Support Black-owned and Black-operated digital broadcast media, www.niceradionetwork.com. Nice Radio Network, broadcasting 24 hours a day, 7 days a week.